So, Berto, I thought we would respond to some patron emails, but I thought we would also do a little follow-up on our last episode on cultural appropriation. What do you say? Ooh, let's follow up. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. My name is Humberto Castaneda, and I plan royal weddings. So, this is a follow-up to our one of our recent episodes on cultural appropriation, uh, have, uh, a lot of people have been emailing and commenting, and uh, I saw a few comments. Yeah, and I would say most are uh, reasoned, and most were culturally appropriate. Yeah, most were I, I could agree with, and were you know thought out questions. But there were other responses that there were no bad responses, but there were responses that indicated to me that some people didn't really get what I was trying to say, which either means it's really a complicated topic and or I didn't explain it very well mm. or I had a tone that didn't really communicate what I was hoping to communicate or it, it is a complicated topic yeah and and a lot of people seemingly are walking away from that episode on cultural appropriation with the idea that there are rules to follow you know I see. like People would e- email me. It's like, well, so I have a Buddha on. I'm a right. white. I'm a white person, and I have a Buddha on my shelf because I like Buddha. I like what he stands for and this kind of thing. Right. And I, I don't understand why you would say that that's wrong. Right. And um, that's either a fault of mine, or it's a, or it's too complicated to get, or people are falling into the same paradigm that really everyone's in, which is right right and wrong. You know, like uh, you, it's wrong to celebrate Cinco de Mayo, for example, you know, (laughs) that kind of without drinking heavily. Right. Is that the, exactly. Uh, uh, You know, that they're basically equating it with political correctness and, Mm. you know, that kind of stuff. So, you know, I get it because um, I, I don't, the more I thought about this topic, the more I realized that I don't think I've ever heard, heard, Anyone talk about cultural appropriation, and I, it's not a it's not a specialty of mine, so it's not right. like I talk to a lot of people about it. But among those that I have talked with or heard online or whatever, I, I've I've never heard anyone talk about it in what I would consider to be a right headed way. Mm. It it's always about essentially if you just Google cultural appropriation on the internet, or if you come across something about cultural appropriation, and correct me if I'm wrong. The message is white people be stupid kind of a thing, right? Probably. I mean, to be honest, I had never heard of this term until maybe a couple of years ago. Yeah. Wait, there was a, what was the thing that, there was a famous thing that sort of started more people talking about this. Well, there was Salazar in, in Spokane, the white woman. Who, that's, that's it. Yes, yeah, that's it. Who said she was like a black person on the inside. Right. Okay. That's the one I'm thinking of. Right. Uh, I didn't remember. I probably had heard it, but I didn't remember consciously knowing that term. Yeah. I'm trying to think of the other hot topics like when uh, Izzy Azalea, Iggy Azalea. Izzy. Izzy or Iggy? Izzy. You think was... Iggy Pop. <laughs> oh, Izzy, Izzy Azalea. Izzy Azalea. <laughs> yeah. Izzy Azalea was is a white Australian right. w- woman who was accused of cultural appropriation because she not only was doing rap and hip hop, mm-hmm. but she also would rap in an accent of a black woman in the South. Ah, yes. What about Eminem? Was Eminem accused of cultural Yeah, I'm sure at the time, but for whatever reason, at least among my circle, he seems to have legitimized himself. I see. Maybe Dr. Dre's, uh, you know, endorsement and his realness having been from the wrong side of the tracks mm. helped to make it so that people didn't see him. But I'm sure he got accused of that early and early see. on. You know, what's uh, interesting is I the feeling I've had a lot um, as I've been in the states was sort of a, a parallel feeling, but not the same phenomena. Uh, Because Mexican culture is very prominent, especially in this area, Uh, even more so in California, of course. But there's a lot of Mexican restaurants and Mexican uh, sort of imagery and things and Cinco de Mayo and stuff like this. And I've always felt that that's the only 
Hispanic sort of cultural thing that's really prominent, right? So, you know, people when they like, oh, you're from the from Colombia. I feel like the only picture in their head is Mexico. Right. Sombrero right. and sombrero. Oh, so you must like sombreros with tacos on top of them, right? While you're celebrating and, and a of pinata. Course, and of course, the picture that the average Seattleite has of the Mexican culture is essentially a car- cartoon. A char- yeah, it's already a caricature. Yeah, right. So I'm I am slotted into a caricature that I'm not even caricatured with, right? Yeah. So, um, but but that is funny because I've always seen some positive. In the fact that we could, here's the alternative that I would certainly hate is uh, Mexican food. Oh, how disgusting. Mexican people, how disgust. You're like Mexicans? Oh, how disgusting. Yeah. So I've, I've always felt like at least Mexican culture is seen positively. Hmm. Like around here, I mean, right? Oh, we love margaritas. We love, oh, you're right? It's like, okay, okay. So I'm not that, but at least you're not associating me with hate. Yeah. Right. So that's like, maybe it's the beaten down kind of mentality, but it's it's uh, I've always felt like, hey, at least there's a positive sense around Hispanic culture in this part of the world. Yeah, I think everyone's experience is different. And yeah. I think that it's, uh, you know, varied in terms of the sort of expectations. You know, when I go to other places, particularly outside the United States, I don't have the fantasy that people are going to when, when I tell them I'm from Seattle, I don't have, I don't have a fantasy that they're going to have a well-rounded picture <laughs> of what an American in right. Seattle is like, right. you know, they're going to say either it rains a lot or Bill Gates or Kurt Cobain or, you know, uh, if that, do you know what right. I mean? Uh, short of that, it's like Seattle, what, you know, like they, they American. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, so, it, it's that, but that's akin to cultural appropriation. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to try to explain it. I don't want to make a whole other episode about this. Right. So I want to kind of do this fast, but anyway, uh, the rules that you'll hear that people will say is like, you know, you can't listen to Elvis because Elvis was culturally appropriating. Black oh, people. right. <laughs> or you can't celebrate Cinco de Mayo and no Beatles. Come on. Let's be honest here. <laughs> well, so people have accused the Beatles right. of culturally appropriating. Right. Uh, black American music. Uh, Cinco de Mayo is a big hot button topic th- lately because it has basically basically become for a lot of white Americans this excuse to get really really drunk on tequi- mm. on tequila and and dress up as a cartoon Mexican mm-hmm. and say cartoonish Mexican phrases like arriba arriba andale, andale. Andale. yeah and and for Mexicans who feel that white America has basically, you know, shit on their people for a long time. Mm -hmm. It feels upsetting to watch other white Americans bastardize a a sacred holiday as an excuse to get drunk. It's like, there's nothing wrong with white people getting together and drinking and Mm -hmm. getting drunk and, and acting like fools. It's another thing that's like, why does it, why do you have to dress up as, it, you know, it'd be like for Japanese, it'd be like there's some random holiday that somehow became popular in the United States and everyone dresses up in like samurai outfits and is like, oh, a soul, oh, a soul, karate chop, karate chop, sure. you know, like I grew up with shit like that and it, it doesn't feel good. You know, it's like, could you, you know, you, you can act like a fool in all sorts of ways. Why do you have to do that? Is it mostly you think because of the power imbalance? Yeah. Right, absolutely. Because you know, growing up in Bogota or Colombia, we culturally appropriated the shit out of the United States. Like you know, all our music uh, that we would listen to when I was like a kid, right. all our clothing styles, the shoes we wore, the sayings. We had so many words that were uh, Spanglish or full English words that it would, and my dad would get so upset. Why do you use that word? That's not a Spanish word. That's a, you're just blah, blah, blah. And, and it was like, all over. and that's what we idolized. We just like yeah. would, would, everything was English or right. US. Exactly. That That's the main point is that in the context of colonialism and centuries of genocide, marginalization, um, you know, displacement, you, when, when you see the, uh, the, the children of those, of those 
genocidal people just kind of cartooning up your your culture in this very haphazard way, it reminds you of all the horrible things that your parents and grandparents and, and even yourself have been through. Mm. It, if, if, a, uh, if a Mexican person in Mexico dresses up like a Dallas cowboy and... Uh, you know, like a cowboy cowboy, not a, yeah. you know, a, a, <laughs> not a football an player. American cowboy and like does like a, you know, um, a dance, like a hoedown. It says, ho, ho, I'm a, I'm a cowboy, you know, like it doesn't hurt our feelings because Mexicans have not raped and killed and displaced cowboys, uh, cowboys, right. right. And Americans, you know, yeah. um, or at least the perception of it isn't as, sure. as, as such. And so that, and that's why it's so hard for white America to to get it. Mm. It's it's because you're potentially at the top of the food chain in terms of genocide, colonialism. You are the ones who have you know, your people and your ancestors have been the ones who have done those things. My ancestors included. I'm half white. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, and your parents aren't walking around with open wounds regarding having been humiliated and put down and denied jobs and, you know, by a particular race of people, you know? Uh, so it, 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 it feels different to you. So anyway, it, there's a lot of other things that I, I did a quick Google of like trying to find something online that, that sort of had some good resource. But again, like even the more well-written articles are basically, basically people of color saying, here's why here's what you can't do like you can't have a henna tattoo mm. white people you can't have a henna tattoo. It's a whole bunch of rules basically. yeah white people you can't put chopsticks in your hair you know as what's a, the wrong what's wrong with henna what is henna well i mean it's those are those temporary tattoos i don't know but yeah. but it's but it's so it's not explained do you know I what see, i mean it, I see. it's not explained in the way that i feel like i when i feel hurt by cultural appropriation i it's all about when I see that, it reminds me of all these other things, mm. and that and that is not often communicated. And I, and and there are other things that I see that remind me of things that I don't care. Like I said last time, for me as a Japanese American, if you dress up as a kamikaze and make fun of a kamikaze, I don't care about that because to me, I associate imper imperial Japanese as the same as Nazis. Right. They, they did horrific, horrible genocide to Chinese, right, Philippines, right. Koreans. They were horrible people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, worse in some ways than Nazis. And so make fun of Imperial Japanese soldiers all you want because they were assholes. Right. Uh, but you make fun of Japanese Americans. Now we're talking about something different. Yeah, but, but making fun is very different from I bought something because I thought it was neat and I didn't realize it would hurt your feelings, right? Right. So, so right. So it's a shade off of it. It's a, it's a, um, an unawareness, you know, uh, a, an un, a unsensitivity to it, you know, um, which you know is less of a transgression. You know, if someone dresses up as a as a Japanese person and is like, oh, so I have big teeth in my front, you know, I don't, I'm a foreigner and. I like raw fish, you know, like that's one thing um, that's obviously hurtful to me. But if you have a Buddha or a Shinto item on your shelf and you have no idea what it means, you know, it, it's to me, I, it doesn't bother me that much. But it but it is just yet another example of just like, do you really understand what that is? You know, or did you just think it was kind of cool? And, did, you know, are you educating yourself on what those things are, you know, it like if I have a Shinto item on my shelf as a Japanese person, in all likelihood, I know what it is. Do you know what I mean? I know the significance and I and I am better able to predict how other people are going to receive that if they come over to my house and see it on my mm. shelf. You know what I mean? Anyway, um, other things are. Uh, so anyway, there, I get it that it's hard to understand cultural appropriation because the way it's explained is often, and even kind of the way I'm explaining it right now, is there's rules, and there, there are things you can do, and there are things you can't. And if you're doing anything or have any item from another culture, you're wrong, and you're a terrible person. And that, that is not what needs to be you know, said. It, it, 
and I, as I said last time, it's all about empathy. And it's about empathy for both quote unquote sides. And by sides, I just mean sides in a particular incident, but really it's empathy for everybody because everyone can be harmed by cultural appropriation, even privileged groups. But anyway, you want to have, we need to have empathy towards the people who accidentally hurt someone's feelings by culturally appropriating someone who is celebrating Cinco de Mayo by dressing up in a sombrero and a, you know, one of those, I don't know what you call them, poncho things and drinking tequila and saying Arriba, Arriba, in all likelihood doesn't know that it hurts someone's feelings. Mm -hmm. They learned it from somewhere and they think it's funny and they're doing it among other people who don't know. And in fact, I've probably done it myself at some point in my life, you know, 20 years, 30 years ago or something. And so, and it wasn't like I knew that it would hurt anyone. So we have to have empathy towards those people and say, they probably don't know. And so, so you just have to start from that place of when you see it, assume that they are accidentally hurting your feelings. Mm. And so approach them as if they're accidentally and, and that their, their heart is good. And so if you approach, if you have to, if you feel like you want to say something, approach them with that attitude because they deserve your empathy in that instance. They deserve right. the benefit of the doubt. And our message of trying to eliminate cultural appropriation is not furthered by ranting and raving at people and having them film you and put it up on YouTube. Because you 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 put you do a Google on, on you do a search on YouTube for cultural appropriation. Most of it are, are people just ranting and raving mm. at seemingly innocent people. Right. Like there's this one that I saw where this guy on Cinco de Mayo is wearing a poncho. I think it looks like a college campus. Mm -hmm. And this woman who's the one filming just runs up to him on campus and just (laughs) starts screaming at him. (laughs) And she's the one who, who posted it, you know, she's like, you got to take that off. You, you are culturally appropriating. And he's, Uh, and he's just like, what? And his (laughs) friends, his friends like descend on her and they all, and they're just all screaming at each other. Uh, You know, this woman is just, screaming at these four frat looking sure. guys and they're screaming back at her and and because the guy's like when i went to mexico i bought this so right. fuck off and she's like you're culturally appropriating and like <laughs> and they're like are you mexican and she's like no that's not the point you know and it's just like <laughs> oh it's just like God. that's that's what's on the internet right the other people we need to have is empathy towards people who have their feelings hurt by things that they feel are culturally appropriated, mm-hmm. you know? That's it. It's just just empathy for those two groups of people, and it changes given the situation. It's not complicated. Before you do something, if you're a privileged person, before you do something, before you buy something, before you dress in a certain dress, just do a little check yeah. on the internet or ask someone. Just, you know, just do a little check to make sure it's not going to hurt anyone's feelings. I assume you don't want to hurt other people's feelings, right? Right. Okay. Kindergartens know that rule. (laughs) Don't hurt other people's feelings, right? Right. Okay. Number two, before you attack someone for culturally appropriating, think about where they're coming from. Think about how they got to do that thing that is bothering you. The young woman in Utah who wears a Chinese dress to prom Think about how she got there. Did she wake up that day and say, fuck Chinese people, and I want to make them feel like shit today? Well, if that's your narrative, then go ahead and attack her. But is that accurate? Or did she just go to the store, and she's looking for dresses, and she came across this Chinese dress, and she was like, huh, I think I look good in this. I think this is a really beautiful dress, and I'll stand out, and I'll look different, and I'm young, I'm a, basically a child and I want right. to wear this dress and, 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 and I think, and, you know, given that she's, she looks like a person of color, she probably wants to dress a little different, you know? Yeah. And God knows maybe and she her has, name is non-standard. Let's yeah. say. And maybe she has a Chinese grandfather or something. I yes, don't think she does because in her reports, but anyway, the point is, is like give people the benefit of the doubt and, and, bef- and when you approach them, you know, try to try to be nice to each other. Again, kindergartens know that. It's, it's that simple. Um, and when in doubt, just kind of don't do stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it, if you're unsure about like, you know, ooh, I want to do this thing that's not for my culture. If you're, you know, if you're in doubt and you really just don't know, just just don't. You know, you don't need to. There's no there's no mandate that everyone has to right. like 
adopt all these different things from other cultures and stuff, you know? Uh, so, so if we all did that, we could solve this problem. It would, the problem would be solved because people would occasionally hurt other people's feelings on accident. Someone would probably say something in a nice way. And the person would be like, Oh my God, thanks for, I didn't know that. I didn't want to hurt your feelings. I'll never do this again. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry for doing that. It, problem solved. Not a big deal. We don't have to have the PC police or create a bunch of hate flame shit on Twitter. We don't have to hurt anyone's feelings. We don't have to have a backlash where all the liberals look like complete dumbasses all the time. Like none of it has to happen. You know what I'm saying, mm-hmm. bro? Yep. What, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I I think that this is true for a lot of different um, interrelational sort of problems. Um, I I do think that there is where it breaks down is that people don't understand what it is to be empathetic, number one. And number two, uh, you know, people are not actually operating from well thought out strategies, right? That's just not a human thing to do. So mostly we look around and we make ad hoc decisions on a daily basis. Right. So we, you know, just look at movies and any number of culturally appropriated dresses and things are worn and tattoos are shown and everything. So people just emulate what they see. And so a lot of them are just literally just say, looking around their life and going, oh, I like that. I like that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. Most, like probably 80% or more of people are not actually sitting there thinking in either direction, neither I, I want to pick that because that would probably piss some people off, nor I should pick that because that won't hurt as many people. Right. You know, like they're just like, I like that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I'll, I'll close with, I, I, I was in prep for this follow up. I was like, I, I need to figure out some example to really help privileged white people get it. And, and it's so hard. It's mm-hmm. so hard to come up with something that would, would really uh, provide 10,000 little cuts. Like I talked about last time. Mm hmm. That would that would just really get on your nerves, you know. I mean, I guess the one thing I could say is, think about any pet peeve you have out there. Like, Berto, what's what's one of your pet peeves? Pet peeve of mine, like is, on the road, or you know, just just it doesn't like, have to do with the culture at all. You sort know? of like a minor thing or a major thing. Whatever, just something that okay. you frequently encounter that bothers you. Okay, people being unnecessarily rude that to strangers. Okay, so. The first time someone was unnecessarily rude to strangers, you were just like, huh, that was bothersome. Yeah. But how many times have you seen it happen? Countless. <laughs> like thousands of times? Probably, yeah. And the next time it happens, do you think you'll have a bigger reaction than the first time Yeah, you it saw definitely it? mounts. Right. And, and if you did react to that person, you think you'd have a little bit more energy around Yeah. That? Yeah. Well, so everyone out there think about something like that's what... That's that's what that's why when you hear people complaining about cultural appropriation, you're like, "What's the big deal? I just had chopsticks in my hair. What's the big deal? I just had a Buddha on my shelf. Mm-hmm. What's the big deal? I, you know, Izzy Azalea likes to rap. What's the big deal? Well, if you're a black person and you've just lived it, your your music that you invented and you brought over from Africa to some extent." forcefully by the way by white people made you come here and you you like and they tried to get rid of your music and you adopted some western things because you wanted to you know not be lynched for seemingly you know uh speaking in your language and stuff and you create this beautiful form of music blues jazz hip-hop and then just year after year, starting from when you invented it in you know the turn of the century around 1900, year after year, you are not the one on the radio and white people bastardize it, They're, they go to the top. Black people are writing blues music, you know, uh, rock and roll music. Elvis bastardizes it, becomes the most famous person of all time. You know, just every little step of the way. And then, and then, thousands upon thousands of examples and then all of a sudden this australian white woman comes along and does it again if it was the first or the fifth time it happened not a big deal but when it's ten thousand times over the span of a hundred years eventually you just get tired of it you know so the example i have that i that i thought of and i don't and tell me if this 
help Spurdo or, you know, would resonate with people is imagine uh, there's a Vietnamese hotel owner. He, he lives in Vietnam and he's never been in the United States, but he loves American culture. You know, he's, he likes Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, Trump and Barack Obama. You know, he just, he just likes it all. He just, right. he just thinks it's cool. America is a cool place, you know, with cool things. And so in his hotel, he decorates his hotel with a bunch of American things, okay? And he, you know, he finds like a Norman Rockwell painting. Mm -hmm. It's a very American. He finds like a Superman poster, like a super, you know, p puts that up. He finds a picture of, I don't know, a space shuttle, puts that up, okay? And, and you know, you can see... Like none of it matches, right? So, and if an American walked in, they'd be like, "And you know, and I've seen stuff like this. I mean, have you ever seen anything?" Oh yeah, absolutely. So you walk in, you're just like, none of these things match, but they match to this person, right? You know what I mean? From afar, this all these things are co are coherent, but yes. to us, it's like these things don't make any sense, you know? <laughs> but okay. And then next to that is a picture of the World Trade Center burning. Right. And debris is falling out. And to the Vietnamese man, he, I'm, I'm guessing, at least this hypothetical, he doesn't have a, he doesn't have a feeling. It's just pictures from America. It's just a picture of an American event. Right. You know? And, and famous. He, yeah, it's a famous picture, famous right. event that happened. And to him, it's like just another picture of America, something that happened. Yeah. Know? And he's right. It is a major event in America, but he doesn't get it because mm -hmm. he wasn't here and he's not afraid of what happened. That's right. just, he saw that from afar. It didn't scare him. Right. And then a New Yorker who maybe even lost someone in the towers mm -hmm. that day uh, comes to that hotel and is, oh, Norman Rockwell. Oh, Superman. Oh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. What the fuck is that doing there? Yeah. <laughs> you, you have a picture of the buildings that my dad, I, my dad might be one of those things that are falling out of the, what is that picture doing in the, on the wall? Right. So that's what it feels like. <laughs> that's what it feels like when you have a group. Now, is that Vietnamese man trying to hurt your feelings? You know, right. is he, is he like, um, does he know what that painting really means or that that picture really means yeah. to a New Yorker, a Manhattanite? No, because he's never been. He's lived in Vietnam and he really has no connection, you know, but mm -hmm. he likes it. It's cool to him. Is that wrong that he has that picture? No, but he doesn't get how it affects other people. Yeah. Is this a good example? Hey, that's a great example. I hadn't thought of that. Um, there, there's this extreme that, that scares me a little bit though, which is the, uh, you know how a lot of the neo-Nazi groups, uh, white supremacist groups, they say, we are losing our culture. All these people come from across the world, basically invade our country and they're stealing our culture and, and they're having our babies with, you know, the babies are no longer, they don't look like us anymore. They are, you know, listening to classical music. What I don't know what they care about, but it's they are they're they're becoming, you know, they they think they're Christian or whatever, right? And it's like they, oh, another example is like black people playing basketball. Uh, no, we invented that sport. That's our sport. Or women in golf, like you know, these kinds of things. And so that's where it turns ugly. And I know that you know in these examples. Well, yeah, those are the ones in power, but it, but in some senses, like you know, the all it would take is for that to become sort of like a minority within a population, and then you're like, now you're having to defend those positions, and so I wonder where how we how we strike a balance, and I guess it's the empathy piece, but it's uh, some of those subgroups don't have empathy. They're like, I don't care, I just don't want you doing what I do or looking at the people I hang around with or don't, you know, well, it's like I, that's the extreme. I believe they do have empathy, but their empathy gets subverted by propaganda. Yeah, that's fair. That's, I could see it. And by fear essentially, and by people not understanding them. That's why actually when white supremacists talk, like I want to preserve my culture and I want 
you know, I want white people to exist in a thousand years. Yeah. I have no problem with that personally. Right. Now I could see other people having problems. Now what's associated with that is lynching and genocide right. and uh, beating up your daughter for dating a black man. Yeah. And, and I don't know, shooting ATF agents that are coming to, to yeah. you know, so it, yeah. But if, if, you know, cause if a Hawaiian said, cause they are, yeah. we are losing our culture because one from genocide and, and two from displacement and three from intermarriage. Cause the majority of Hawaiians who live on Hawaii are actually, who look Hawaiian are actually Asian. They're actually Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Filipino. And there's very few Hawaiian natives mm. who are a very specific tribe, which you can imagine because this Island was in the middle of nowhere for a long time. Right. Uh, isolated, you know, they're, they're much more akin to like Samoans and this kind of thing. Right. So the, uh, so the notion that Hawaiian natives, the true race of Hawaiians want to preserve their culture and to be around in a thousand years is not a bad thing in my eyes. And so it's the same if people in the South are saying that they, they want the same things. So that part I will empathize with. What's what is extended from that is, you know, uh, aggrandizing con the Confederacy, uh, being wistful about a day when you could enslave other people, uh, talks right. about Nazism and genocide of the Jews and all this kind of stuff. Like, I, I have almost zero empathy on the other hand for that. For the, hey, I, I, was, I want my culture to be around. Well, what and about the Hawaiians? I, I have zero empathy. And the reason I have zero empathy, or at least almost zero empathy, is because the only cultures that are around today are the ones that survived by pretty much killing off the other cultures. So the, the ones we see hanging around are the winners. And, and no one is crying tears for the ones that are extinct now. Uh, case in point in the United States, you don't hear these same groups going like, and by all means, let's make sure the Native American culture thrives into the next millennium. You know, like that one was nearly wiped out. And South America fully wiped out pretty much, right? And yet here we are, and we're the, the, the lucky winners, and we're now crying about our cultures hanging around. I look at it like, look, the, the world is way past the point of let's, let's try to protect each other from intermarrying. Intermarrying only leads to better genetic diversity, etc. Yeah. So yes, it is quite possible that the average skin color around the world is going to continue to be brown. <laughs> and that's the way. So I, I sort of look at it like, yeah, it's, it's, it's the way of the history, man. Dinosaurs are not around. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's illogical in terms if you privilege certain things. But, you know, some people get a tremendous amount of meaning from tradition and from their culture. Yeah. And that I get, yes. And, and so, uh, and there is an argument for retaining some diversity, you right. know, like for example, uh, our world is heading towards essentially a one language world, mm -hmm. uh, English being the one language. Right. And, and there's a loss when you lose languages not only just culturally speaking but you also lose like diversity of of syntax diversity of um poetry and sure. and expression in that language yep. and so you know there's pros and cons now if you ask me i'm the same as you like well our society our world i'm guessing would be much better and less violent if we all spoke the same language, you know, now yeah. I win that because I speak English, <laughs> hey, you know, sure. We get lucky in that case, but I, I don't <laughs> care. It could it's say Chinese or Esperanto. I don't right. care really. But when I, ever since I was a young kid, I was like, why hasn't somebody, why hasn't some leader come forward and yeah. just said, let's blend all the languages so everyone can understand each other. Right. Like we have the capability to do that. Why aren't we doing that? There's so many things that, are lost by the fact that we are so fragmented by yeah. by an inability to communicate with each other and and so i get that but again at the same time if you're one of those people that gets tremendous amount of meaning you know for example just for me i don't really relate to the pres pre preservation of culture uh for myself one because i'm bicultural 
but also because, well, whatever. But, but if you told me that, so I've done all this genealogy and I've looked yeah, into my right. family history. If, if you, if someone came along and said, that's illogical, there's no point in knowing your genealogy. Who, what does it matter who your great, 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 great grandfather was? Sure. It, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. You're just wasting your time, <laughs> which is true. Well, yeah, but by that meter, anything is a waste of time. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's, that's yeah. exactly true. Yeah. So for a group of people to decide that it's meaningful to them that they want to preserve their culture is just another example of that. Yeah. Oh, uh, and, and, and I, I should be clear. Like I certainly, you know, I'm a, I'm more of a romantic than a pragmatic. So in my mind, I love tradition. I love, even though, for example, even though I, I, I'm not, you know, practicing a religion, right? I love Christmas and I love these traditions and things like this, right? So for me, actually, it would be quite painful if one day a, a decree came down. Uh, only the following holidays and celebrations can be happening around the world None other. Like, that would be terrible. That'd be horrible. So, I'm certainly not uh, advocating, you know, like a mandated homogeneity of, of the world or something. But what I am saying is that I don't fear, nor do I have, uh, let's say, I don't worry too much when someone says, uh, oh, you know, white people are, or let's pick a different, uh, such and such group of people is not having as many babies as quickly as, as yeah. but others are. And then I'm like, yeah, you know, I mean, then have more babies, I guess. You know, it's like, yeah. I, I just don't worry about that as much. But I, I certainly respect, uh, and I love, I love actual, that diversity that you're alluding to, like the diversity of food, the diversity of, of imagery and, and architecture and all these things. That is actually beautiful and it would be, sort of artistically sad if if all buildings look the same, if all art looked the same. Yeah. Now, that said, um, I don't know if that's the end state when you do have 7 billion people all sort of with independent thought, if it is not a oppressive society that is. Yeah. So we got through this conversation without yelling at each other. What? I feel like we should, because, <laughs> you know, so at the end of, we got in a fight last time, we talked about it, and then... Uh, I, and then I asked the question, I wonder how the listeners uh-huh. feel. And people commented on that too. They're, they're like, actually, it's pretty cool to, because a lot of, they don't want to listen to a podcast where it's like right. everyone's just constantly agreeing with each other. That's what I felt. I was like, come on. Yeah. Keep it real. But I, I want to, but honestly, when I listen to podcasts and people fight, it makes me uncomfortable too. Does it? But it only makes me uncomfortable because. I'm worried about something. Mommy and daddy are fighting. <laughs> right. I'm worried. And somebody actually commented. They're like, yeah, sometimes when you guys fight, I worry that you guys are going to break up and, and, <laughs> and you won't do the podcast anymore. Um, Berto and I have been in much worse fights. <laughs> yes. We have had uh, a handful of uh, fights that in real life, not on the podcast, that would... Uh, make these other fights look like, uh, you know, frolics in a field. You know what I mean? We, we fights that went on for uh, months, you know, really. Yeah. And we're not, I don't want to repeat those, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. They were, they were not good. Uh, and we're still together and we continued to podcast through one of those fights. Actually. That's right. That's right. And so, uh, so listeners don't worry about it. Don't worry. About it. The other thing is, is that, Bert, Bert and I, you know, are close friends and understand that we're because we do the podcast, but we're also, for the most part, we're first we're friends outside the podcast. Right. You know, um, the other thing is is that correct me if I'm wrong, is that you and I, I, I know for myself, but I think for you, is that you know, fighting is actually a good thing in life yep. w- when it's done within reason. You know, yeah. Uh, conflict, disagreeing, passion, debate. Well, I, I mean, like, so to be clear, I don't enjoy hanging around an environment where I cannot be myself. And when being myself means that people will disagree with me, that just happens. That comes with the territory. What I, Where I have grown from where I was younger is that I try... <laughs> somewhat successful here or there. I try not to just argue to argue anymore, which uh, the younger I was, I think I would argue just to argue about almost anything, you know? And I had some 
epically long. I mean, like there's some that lasted like all night long about uh, very random topics. And in cases where I really, at many points throughout that, I kept telling myself like, why are you still arguing about it? Like just drop it, right? Um, so I'm very argumentative. I like to argue. But the flip side of that is uh, if if I'm in a setting and I, fear, and I fear like, well, I better not say anything. I better just not. I better... That's fine. I'll do it out of politeness. But it's not a place I'm going to want to be at long term. Yeah. So if, if I felt like that was the environment of the podcast, I would say, okay, well, maybe this isn't for me, you know? Instead, like, I feel comfortable that if I disagree with something, I can say it. And I might be wrong, probably wrong a lot, but it doesn't matter. It's like we, in fact, you've given me a lot of perspectives, some famous ones in a couple episodes where it's like, oh, like, I still remember the suicide episode where you and the guest helped me completely change my mental model in just that one episode. And yet that's a case where I could have been politically correct during the episode and been like, oh, wow, that's terrible. But inside being like, this is bullshit. This is bullshit. Right. Instead, I said what I felt yeah. and I learned. Right. Yeah. And uh, I've learned from you. Uh, I've learned from a lot of things from you. I can't remember anything now. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly they stuck. <laughs> All right. Let's take a break. Yes. All right, we're back from the break. Berto, are you going to start a Twitter? Because people are asking that you start your own <laughs> yeah, Twitter. Yeah, I guess I'm going to have to. What, what does one say on a Twitter? What What is your Twitter handle going to... Or did you, do you have an old handle? Uh, I pro I'll probably start a new one. I, uh, I don't have an active account. What will it be, do you think? Oh, uh, Like, uh, let's Psych see. Berto? Psycho Berto? <laughs> um, Psycho Berto, that, that could be... I don't know. I'll have to think about it. But but what do you say when you're on Twitter? Like, what are the ty types of things people would like to hear? I don't. I don't. Well, it's the same as any other social media. But what I don't get about Twitter is the layout. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Like on Facebook, I understand that the way it looks. You know, yeah. like when someone when someone posts something and there's comments and there's likes, it's all understandable to me. The right. the the format. But on Twitter, I'm looking at my notifications and I'm just like, right. some of these aren't even of, don't even involve me. Yeah. And then, so I'm going to have to do like hashtags and yeah. tag various people randomly. I, and, I guess. and it sounds like I need to say really offensive things that get me in trouble. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it would, it would help the podcast if someone was, if someone was active on Twitter and... Um, seems like it might as well be you. <laughs> okay, I'll give it a try. We'll see if it's engaging or not. C I'll be like, I didn't add enough corn to my tortillas this morning. Honestly, <laughs> do, you know, I think I think that's I think that's part of it. Uh, April is is taking over the fan page, which is great. Uh, have you seen anything that's been going on over there lately? Uh, I've seen a few posts. Honestly, uh, I've been off of social media for a little bit because I, I had several I was very busy with oh. work for a bit yeah so I, I've been spending long evenings and so I haven't really paid too, too much attention but so I want to send some swag to some patrons and I thought I would pick the newest patron who has a picture uploaded because I always like to look at your face and the first oh. the newest patron that we have is Dennis from Connecticut. Woo! And Dennis has his mug uploaded right there. The next one is Stephanie from North Carolina. Oh. And let's see, the next one we have is uh, Carolyn from New York. Nice. Uh, wait, that one doesn't make any sense, but I'll, we'll say that one. Wait, Carolyn can't live in New York? Well, it's just that she's further back, but for whatever reason, oh, I, see. Uh, I said her name. Uh, then we have Steve from Ohio. Steve. Steve uploaded his photograph. Is everything really better in Ohio? I, I, ha I have a friend who would always claim that whatever thing you were talking about, the best version of that was in Ohio. Is that the song by what, uh, The Pretenders? I don't know, but we'd be like... We'd be at lunch and someone orders ice cream. We're like, wow. Oh, that you really vanilla. had a friend. No, I really do. Yeah. Oh. And it's like, this, this vanilla ice cream is great. It's like, oh, you think that's great? The vanilla ice cream on Fifth Street in Ohio is the best. You know, it's always like Fifth Ohio Street. had the best thing. Um, that is weird. I did, I've never heard anyone claim that Ohio has the best. Everything. Yeah. 
<laughs> uh, one more person is Skylin from Oregon. So Skylin, Stephen, Carolyn, Stephanie, and Dennis, you are our uh, patrons who have pictures, who have become patrons recently. Thank you so much. Woo! Um, we also have a drawing that someone sent to me. Oh, they sent it? Yeah. So, they, so you showed me a picture of the drawing? Yeah, so a fan. Wow. Our first fan art. Oh, that is beautiful. Yeah. Psychology in Seattle. Very nicely drawn. It's got the little uh, silhouette of the city. Yeah. Although it's missing like a million more buildings now. Yeah. Uh, it's and got our little Psy, sim, psy symbol. Also, wow. uh, what else did I want to tell you? Oh, I, I'm, I'm looking into getting a t-shirt and I have hired the fellow who, um, oh no, I actually just uh, restarted my screen here. Crap, I'll have to listen back to see who I'm giving. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, I landed on Skyland. Okay, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do a t-shirt. Uh, someone reached out to me and said, why don't you have a t-shirt? And I was like, I don't know. And they're like, well, let's, let's, let's get that going for you. And so, uh, I'm going to hire the guy who made our albums. Our, our missionary album art? Yeah. Oh, nice. And so... Has he done art for your other albums? Uh, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. I, I just like his style. Yeah, I, I really like that. It's sort of, a, sort of an anime, fine yeah. art style. And the, what I told him to do was take you and me and uh, draw us uh, looking at, you know the camera so to speak with our thumbs up <laughs> with and above it it says take care of yourself because you deserve it nice nice anyway, that's great so we'll see how that turns out i saw my old t-shirt yeah baby blues yeah uh all right next patron email is from alexandra alexander asks why are some things so creepy to us mm. like dolls or chucky <laughs> chucky or or clowns right or people staring at us for a long time. Why is that, Berto? What do you think? Uh, some people have that. Uh, what's that called? The when you when you have a fear or disgust of the uh, th like the little many eyes or the little bumps that stick out. It's oh, got yeah. a name. Trichotillomania. Yeah, some like yeah. Wait, is that phobia? Trick tr tr trichophobia or something like that. Yeah, trichotillomania. I think is pulling hair. If I know. yeah, it's like trichophobia or something. That that. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so why do people find things creepy? Um, all right, so I do think that there is, you know, we learn as, as we grow up and probably some amount of instinct uh, that there are risks to our life. You know, there's some things that are dangerous to our well-being. Um, for example, uh, I think instinctually a lot of mammals and certainly humans, certainly apes, are, are very scared of snakes, you know, uh, snakes can kill. <laughs> so if you're a mammal, you're out and about and a snake bites you, you could, you could easily die. Um, it's also true that we have sort of a quick reaction and uh, aversion or, or, or fear of, of potentially poisonous insects like snakes. Well, what about, or like, sorry, like uh, spiders. What about clowns? Okay. So clowns is an interesting one. So uh, a clown has grotesque features. Right now, grotesque doesn't just mean gross, right? It can mean exaggerated, out of out of alignment, out of symmetry. These kinds of things. A clown has a large red nose, big exaggerated eyes, and sort of a permanent smile, and that can cause a mental a cognitive dissonance because we're, no one smiles indefinitely. No one has exaggerated features like this. And if you see a, if you see a clown up close. It's especially creepy. So clowns were designed to be looked at at a distance. You'd have these situations where you have a circus and hundreds of yards away in the tiny little ring, there are some performers and they, they have exaggerated makeup so that at a distance it looks engaging and entertaining. Very much like in, in old productions of, of stage, right? You'd have exaggerated makeup. People would exaggerate their, their expressions. But when you look at a clown up close or on a big screen in a theater, that doesn't look so so nice and inviting. You know, it's all of a sudden a pale white face, big exaggerated eyes, a big bulbous nose in front of you. And uh, generally, uh, I think that triggers some alerts like there's something not right here. 
Yeah, uh, you are exhibiting yeah, a version of the explanation that I see a lot that is is wrong. <laughs> uh, and let me explain. Uh, people generally believe that creepy things are inherently creepy, the way that you're basically describing. Well, I didn't say that about clowns. I said that about snakes and spiders. Okay, so but even that. Uh, but you are basically saying that about clowns. You're saying that uh, it, it's there's something inherently creepy about a clown up close. Not a clown about so whatever clowns uh, well, the typical kinds of clown makeup and that well, the generalization is that animals get comfortable with common surroundings, and then whenever something is outside of the boundaries of what they're used to, then it, it triggers a lot of new information. But some of that can be perceived as threat. And if it's right. perceived as threat, right. that's creepy. So it, it's a version of inherent, and which is a very common way of thinking because we tend, to, when we look for explanations as to why we are the way that we are, we, at least in our culture, tend to privilege explanations of inherentness or of naturalness. Right? Oh, but you're assuming that you're assuming that this starts as soon as you're born, which. Is not necessarily the case. Like, well, what are you saying? We don't know exactly. Like, at some point, kids start associating frowns with negative, right? Is that because in general it's in their genetic code, or okay. just people frown and that's negative? Well, we're heading more in a more in an accurate direction with that, but uh, but let me let me explain. So, um, we almost everything we find fearful and more specifically creepy, we have learned it. Even spiders, uh, for example, for me. I'm not afraid of spiders because in my family, for whatever reason, no one was really afraid of spiders. And so to this day, um, if a spider is crawling on my body, I'm like, huh, you know, I, I have a spider. Whereas other people who grew up just a couple blocks away from me in the same culture with the same ideas in the air are mortally afraid of spiders, you know, where it's so, so spiders. Now, it seems likely that we evolved to uh, have certain things likely to be afraid of, but, but they're not inherently fearful. Uh, and I'll get to the clowns thing in a sec, but let me, let me explain how we actually condition our children to be afraid of things. We really, um, I mean, you're getting a little bit towards it in terms of like we start to associate frowns in this thing, but it's really more comprehensive than that. We, as human beings, are highly reactive to things. Do you know what I mean? Yep. You put a spider through a room, and someone, in, if you, and you put 10 people, some of those people are going to have a very noticeable emotional reaction. Now, we tend to think of it as like, why well, I'm just reacting normally. But like, you're also signaling to a lot of people what's happening. You know, you're screaming. It's like the scream isn't going to help you with the spider. You're signaling to everyone around you that you're afraid you're and you're going to jump up and you're going to shake your hands and you're going to, you're going to, uh, you know, there's, it, there's a lot of communication, I should say around how you're feeling and particularly when yep. you're scared. And so when you have children, infants who are generally not afraid of anything, you know, when they, when right. they first come out because they don't know, they can't differentiate between danger. And right. that, that's why we have to teach children not to put their hand into a fire. That's why I have to teach children not to walk into the street. By the time a child is seven, if you've done things right, they're terrified of the street, right? <laughs> right? They're terrified of dogs. They're terrified of fire. They're terrified of the stove. They're terrified of uh, sharp things. You know? Yeah, yeah. But, but to be clear, you cannot train an animal if they don't have inherent programming already. Right. So, so, we, so we have a template for fear. Yeah. That... We learn through culture, which is right. the perfect thing, because uh, which is much better uh, in some most ways to than to other animals. Like you know, to my cat, she's afraid of things that I'm sure she wasn't taught. Yeah, that she just inherently is afraid of. Where I'm just like, stop being afraid of that. You know, whereas us humans, we can actually teach our children what to be afraid of. That the problem is, is that we don't always have logical fears as adults. Yeah. Okay, and so we in turn, teach our children illogical yeah. fears. So, for example, just, you know, you uh, get getting to horror movies, okay? Like, they will say, 
you know, scary music, you know, dissonant notes, right? Is, yep. ooh, it's, you know, right. like to, to us, it sounds inherently scary. But to people in other cultures, and they've done these tests, it is not scary to people in other cultures. It's scary to us because we have watched horror movies. Well, there, there, is, there is that. But certainly um, in Western musical development, uh, it, the rules were established fairly early on to be right. to have only used the 12 tones. Yeah. And not only only use the 12 tones, but essentially... Don't play dissonant notes. Don't play dissonant notes. Exactly. So when you are raised in a culture that has particular musical conventions and you associate particular notes with scary things, like everyone has seen a horror movie, you know, in, in our culture as far, you know, I don't, I, don't, yeah. I don't know of anyone who has it. And many people have seen at least 10, you know what I mean? And they perfectly design these horror movies to scare you. And so, the, and they associate certain things and there's certain um, inherently, I would say inherently scary things like something that looks like a monster jumps out and bites someone's head off. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so we learn they're, they're mildly traumatic to us, but it's entertainment. So we like it, but all these conventions in Western music and horror get associated with things like that. The music, the, um, I don't know, just certain ways it looks, you know? And, uh, and so, so that's, you have to understand is like all the things that we find scary, most of the things we find scary and pretty much all the things we find creepy are things we have decided to be creepy and you've, and they are absolutely creepy to you. I don't, I'm not taking away, like you're just making it up. Like it's in your head. If we hooked you up to a, a device and, you know, if you're afraid of clowns and put a clown in a room, your body would freak out. It's real. You're, you're having a real reaction, but it's not inherent. It's something that you've, you've been programmed. For example, I'm old enough to remember when clowns were beloved. Uh, one of the most famous child, probably the most beloved childhood um, entertainer in Seattle. J.P. Patches. Was J.P. Patches, which is a classic creepy clown. And he had a even creepier drag queen um, uh, other clown named Gertrude. And these clowns would go to parades and kids like me and my older siblings would run up to him and we'd watch him every, every day before school, JP patches was on and that's what I would watch, you know? And I, so for me, when I see a clown, I don't have any association with creepiness. I love clowns. I'm, I'm not, you know, I have older people than me love clowns. You know, they have like pictures of clowns mm -hmm. or clown dolls or something. For some reason, right about at my age, everyone younger than me is in just incredibly creeped out by, by clowns. Right. And so how is that? How, how is me and everyone older than me love clowns? Like when my mom sees a clown, she is delighted. It's like Santa Claus. She's like, oh, a clown. And she runs up and, oh, what are you doing? You know, like. Well, my, my hypothesis is that. Um, so let's, let's pause on clowns for a second to make my point. Uh, let's say that you are a child. And in walks a person with long canine fangs with sort of like a little blood dripping from it and long black hair that covers a lot of their face, very pale skin. Mm. And everyone around you greets them highly positively. <laughs> Hi, it's Uncle Morty, the, the, the mortician. Every year at this time, he brings us gifts and blah, blah. And he's like, you know, whatever. And then everyone's really reacting positively. It seems incredible to imagine, but I bet you would probably develop a positive association with Uncle Morty. Yeah. However, a lot of your animal like instincts might be fighting against that because it's like there's big sharp teeth and sharp pointy objects with blood. Right. So there's right? certain right. So is there a bigger So point? my point with the clowns is that I argue that a clown and it depends what kind of clown we're talking about, but the general clown I, I think it's extremely outside of the norm of what what a human would expect to see as another human looking like. Absolutely. And humans in general don't react positively to humans that don't look like what they expect. Hence, racism and, uh, you know, wars and everything, right? So, we are so, very... So, you're, you're making the argument that 
clowns are inherently creepy and my mom no, no. because she was positively associated with clowns she wasn't afraid of clowns uh, uh, what i'm saying is that clowns just like anything else that doesn't look like us that's sort of human but not quite is hello something. kitty hello kitty looks nothing like a human hello kitty is beloved but hello kitty is not close to a human like there's that that uncanny, it's close. it has it has a uh, eyes and a, and a nose there's a big difference between a, a human walking I'm just saying, around i'm just saying you are making up a story no, which no, is but, fine but, but, listen, but it's listen. not it's not measurable just, just what i'm saying is this like throughout throughout time immemorial um civilization and and An- i'm not saying it's genetic anime, i don't care if anime it's genetic. characters are are also you know like uh, beloved and- yeah, right right but what i'm saying is that throughout time immemorial civilizations have feared other civilizations and that's when the differences between them is like so slight by any modern terms that it's ridiculous, right? In fact, sometimes they look identical, right? But they speak with a slight s different than the t, and it's like crazy. But right? that's yeah. learned, that's right. taught. But, but Ch- I don't Ch- care, right? I, I'm not, I'm not debating how much this genetic. I'm not debating any of that. What I am saying is that that is universal. Like that's that happens all of them. It's universally so clown, taught. It's universally a clown taught. is extremely different looking. <laughs> so by all measures, when that clown walks in the room. Yeah, it's still you're you still making be, an inherent argument essentially. No, so your district. So what happens is you're confusing the fact that you also cannot draw a clear line where things become taught and things are inherent. But I'm not drawing that line. I'm saying that a child of above a certain age, where they have words and some understanding, is generally not very accommodating to strangers. And when a stranger walks in that looks completely unlike any other human. By default, I would expect that child to go hide behind mama's legs. And but when he, every adult around them is positively reacting to that, okay. they start learning, oh, maybe this thing is really fun. What happened, though, is clowns went out of style. So nowadays, you don't see clowns. I, I have a different theory. And of course, there's no way for either of us to prove this. But I believe that what happened was uh, poltergeist. So... You've seen Poltergeist, right? When I saw that movie, that was the first, that was what, 82, 83 or something? That was the first time that I remember, and I remember it being very poignant because I was young, I was like 12 years old, where a clown was associated with danger. And it was such, you know, this is, this is, um, you know, Steven Spielberg. Mm -hmm. They associated that clown in that closet with such terror to me that like i it kind of tilted me a little bit towards clowns are creepy you know and then from and then because everyone copies steven spielberg yeah there were there were clowns like from that point forward if there was a if you needed to scare people you had a clown uh the other thing that they put well, in- but you're making the op you're trying to you're sort of trying to make it sound that clowns are inherently not scary. No, I'm saying they're, <laughs> people are indifferent, probably. I'm agreeing with you to some extent in that, uh, or I guess I'm agreeing with you wholly, that yeah. when uh, children are basically afraid of strangers, I mean, you, you know, yeah. you, if you watch a four-year-old and they could have a stranger that looks exactly I, I, like I, daddy I, I, and they will be yes. afraid of it. I think we're actually agreeing because what you're saying is that at up to a certain point, clowns were presented to kids as very positive, fun things. And after a certain point, clowns were presented to kids as scary things. Right. But, I, and, I, and I agree. Yeah. And also that uh, if we had no cultural uh, teaching and socialization of children to clowns, they would probably just think of clowns like, well, what's that? Or they would just react to it the way they react to most things that look strange to them. You know what I mean? Like, I guess you could actually draw a parallel to kids when they go to Disneyland and they see Goofy and they've never seen Goofy before. Yeah. Like some kids freak out. Yeah. Like, oh my God, Goofy. Like, what yes. the hell is that thing? Yes. And, and there's, and they're, you know, that's just a dog. It's not really, you know, it's not clown-like. It just looks yeah. like a dog, you know? And so... Uh, so well so so one example i i can give of but over time once you love goofy or once you associate people walking around in suits like that with positive things and yes. you like them but at the same time four-year-olds are also afraid of like the gas attendant right. or uncle joe who doesn't right. come over very often you know what i mean uh, so one example like I, I i firmly believe that there's some set of things that have been developed uh genetically it's some set of patterns that uh, so for example 
um, I, I know of a cat that when the cat was fairly young, the owner was crawling around on the ground for fun, not trying to scare the cat at all. But, you know, cats, when they when they are trying to appear threatening, they curl up their back, right? And the cat must have looked at that person and somehow interpreted that position as a threat. And they curled their back, hissed, and, and started trying to attack, right? And from there on, like, they developed sort of this pattern where, like, they didn't like that person, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I think in a similar way... Yeah, it, 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 you're not going to get an argument, and yeah. I've made the argument, yeah. that we're born with psychological mechanisms yeah. that will help us, you know, a little bit to survive in a world that has typical things that are dangerous. Yeah. But I, I see your point. Like, I do agree that uh, context is incredibly important for a human being. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's measurable because all you have to do yeah. is even look at people in our own culture, let alone compare cultures, right. to know that some people are terrified of some things and some people are, are right. not terrified at all. It's like the idea of ghosts, right? Yeah. In some cultures, the dead ghosts are sort of like a positive thing. Right. There are people who dig up their dead grandma after having mm -hmm. decomposed after a year. And as a family, you clean the bones and you, you know, you, I don't know what they do after that, some ceremony and they do some, like imagine a white American family, <laughs> you know, going to the cemetery I, and digging up grandma. That seems gruesome. Right. It's, it's not only, not only <laughs> culturally creepy and gruesome and, and terrifying, but it's also like disrespectful right, and like, right, right. And, and so, right. again, uh, all you got to do is look a little bit around the world and realize right. that uh, y the way you feel is not inherent to biology. Whereas there are some things, and I'm not saying even these are fully universal because of bell curves, essentially, but, but I, 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 there are some things like um, smells and tastes that we try to, in general, steer away from. Right. Even because that, I want to. I want to dispel that because there's been a lot of research on that as well. There, there are very few things that are universal along those lines. I don't know the exact um, uh, research, but I do know enough to know that there are. Uh, again, it feels like because a lot of people around us consider certain things to be gross and certain things to be appealing. And uh, again, when you compare people around the world, it, it varies. But there are some things that are universal. For example, ammonia, for whatever, for whatever yeah. reason. Well, but, but even just positive things like, uh, again, not every single organism, right? But uh, sugar yeah. <laughs> tends to stimulate positive reactions. Right. So, so, and I've made this argument yeah. before as well, is that sugar, salt, fats tend to be enjoyed by most humans right. uh, across cultures because we probably evolved to right. crave those things and like those things because they are fairly rare on the African side. And we area. haven't been able to quickly evolve out of those cravings. Right. <laughs> and we care a little bit, we care a lot less about fiber uh, because it was very abundant. Right. It was, it was. You couldn't help but eat it fiber. was It was just grass, you yeah. know? And so uh, now, to us, we're like, well, of course sugar is better than fiber because sugar is just so much inherently better. <laughs> and it's like, well, we evolved that way. Right. We could have evolved if, if fiber was really rare, we would have craved fiber and we'd all right. be eating a bunch of celery sticks or I don't even know what, what has fiber in it. Like uh, wheat husks, uh, yeah. dirt, <laughs> dirt. Cabbage. <laughs> okay, <Any> cabbage. <laughs> um, beans, beans have a lot of fiber. <laughs> right. And, and, but things that are disgusting are actually quite learned. So, uh, which makes sense given evolution, because a lot of, there's a lot of things available to eat. You know, you have fermented things that smell disgusting. I mean, you know, I love kimchi. I, I open up a jar of kimchi and, you know, two blocks away, someone is plugging their nose. K kimchi to most people is disgusting. Uh, yeah, I, I, I get that. But uh, rotting flesh is a fairly universally avoided. Smell. Right, right. So there are, so there are some yeah. things that would make sense that we would evolve right. like rotting flesh because uh, it would be associated with disease right. and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, uh, the last thing I'll say here is patron Travis wrote in and said, if you and Umberto want to watch a really amazing movie, I would suggest let the right one in. Berto, yes. have you seen this movie? Uh, I've seen it once. So, so, and it's been a while, but yes, very enjoyable. What'd you think about it? 
Uh, you know, I I love in general vi- uh, vampire, like vampire lore, but um, it's so rare that there isn't just like a retelling of the same thing. Hmm. And anytime I get to see a movie that's either or or, or about any sort of uh, fictional creatures, but told in an interesting way, um, I I really get a kick out of it. Yeah, so, I, th- I think this. So this movie was what, like 10, 20, 10, 12 years ago, or something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it was like the first movie, or one of the first movies I remember that came out that really took a an old, tired legend and made it really interesting. You right. Know, you could see like after that, so many other things that have been like similar, yeah. really cutting edge pop culture creations that. Right take something and subvert it, you know? Like, like one example on a different one, but like, remember when uh, 28 Days Later, or, yeah, yeah 28 Days Later, um, it, it might have not been the first, but certainly the first mainstream where zombies were fast. Yeah, yeah. And so I remember being in the movie feeling so much more threatened by that. Yeah. Uh, it's a Swedish movie, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, an eighth Swedish, and I liked it. Uh, I don't remember it that well. Yeah. But I remember the beginning, I was like, because it, you know, it was sold to me. It built like, slowly. Yeah, it was sold to me as like, a. if you don't like horror movies, you'll still like this movie. Because mm-hmm. I don't like horror movies. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I, I do, but I, I know we've talked about this. Yeah, I, I, I get why people like horror movies, but to me, the, most of them just follow like this really formulaic thing. <laughs> but I guess most movies do, you know, hero movies do, and I like hero movies. Yeah. So, yeah, but... Uh, so I was sold like you should watch this because it's not like a normal horror movie. So the beginning I was like, okay, this is not a normal horror right. movie. But then it kind of started to get into that genre. It you know? does, yeah, it does slip back into the. Uh, it, it's certainly not like completely unlike anything before it, right? Right, right. But um, it did take some unique angles, and I liked the tone of it was yeah. interesting. You right, know, the, there's like if I remember right, there's kids. Yep, and um, yeah. And yeah. one of the kids is something. Anyway, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I recommend it if you let the right one in. Swedish movie, uh, pretty good. All right. Uh, I don't know. Did you see the remake? The the U.S. remake? I did not. Okay. I don't. I didn't either. I don't know if it's good, but. All right, Berto. What's the last word on today's episode? I'm scared. I'm scared of clowns inherently. I was born with a fear. You know, actually, um, I, I think I've. I've pretty sure i've talked about this but you know when i was five i was asleep having this nightmare of this giant being trapped in this giant tarantula web and i mean giant bigger than a car i think it was as big as a house and i was trapped and it was coming to get me and i woke up it was in the middle of the night and right on my pillow was a little spider i screamed so hard my dad came rushing in i remember the scene like it's in my head he comes rushing in he thought it was someone who was breaking in or something he's what's going on and i'm like spider and my dad's like ah it's a tiny spider you know but he didn't understand all the context i became petrified of spiders for years yeah it traumatized for years and it was so much so that I sort of developed a spidey sense about spiders. I would be in the room and I'd like get this feeling and I'd look over and sure enough, there was a spider in the wall. Um, when I was like in college, we I remember we were watching TV one time at my place and this monstrous, I mean, you know those huge spiders we get around here? That's like, yeah. they, they seem unnaturally big. Uh, not as big as like Australia spiders, but anyways, it was crawling behind the television and me and my buddy, we were both like, ah! and our, our uh, like Mitch, <laughs> and we had a friend who was a female and she was like, I'll handle this. And then she took the spider out. But years later, I was at a party. It was like, I don't know, some social event. I was some party at some house and I, I had had a couple drinks, whatever. And I was talking to this girl and all of a sudden she freaks out because there's a spider <laughs> and you know what happened? My little male ego kicked in. I'm like, I'll handle this. And I did. And I grabbed the glass and I put it over the spider and I think, and I took it outside. And from there on, cured. Did she sleep with you? No, but, <laughs> but it could have worked. No, but you know, it was like this one of these things where it was really just this mental flip. And nowadays, even if they're big, yeah. I can go and handle it. Right. Yeah. I, I think... Some people can make that flip. Some people have been traumatized so much that they can't make that flip. 
But I do find that some people, it's almost like they like to be afraid of spiders yeah. or something, you know? Uh, maybe oh, maybe your... I just say that because no, I'm no. like, why are you afraid of spiders? No, no, some things become part of our personality, part of our person. Right, identity, and, right. Yeah, and sort of like not acting that out would feel foreign. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I grew up in a very uh, woodsy area, and our house was surrounded by woods, and we were also kind of in a in a tiny little valley, uh-huh. and so we were in the shade. Oh yeah, <laughs> we uh, there were there were there you know there was there's very little landscaping around there, so the the woods would just came right up to our house, and our house was you know not new, and it right. had, had a lot of holes that things could get in, and so. At any given time in my room, there was probably like five spiders. Right. You know, if I looked around enough, there were there were <laughs> spiders and there were mosquitoes and those what we call mosquito eaters, which I think are they call them mayflies. Oh, got it. There were centipedes. There were potato bugs. There were yeah worms, just little worm <laughs> slugs. You know, and they would you know make their way. I mean, let alone when I was playing in the woods, Outside, right? <laughs> they would they would be in my room while I'm sleeping and. Yeah. And I'd wake up with a spider on my head, or a centipede on my chest, or a pot- really, that's awesome <laughs> potato bug, like in my in in on my leg, or you know, there's just there's oh just bugs. God. And so to me, it uh, and ants. Oh, there are a ton of ants, black and red ants, and and <laughs> and you know, we didn't have video games in the '70s, so I would I would make little terrariums out of bugs. You know? nice. I'd get bugs and try to make them battle. You that's know, that's so cool. And so it just it to that was me. Just the thing. Yeah, it's just the thing, and, yeah. and no one in no one in my life was afraid of any of those yeah. things, and so I'm not afraid of. Well, those as a as an even further down that line example, uh, uh, a cousin of my brother. So he's not actually my cousin because my brother's my half brother, but or uh, step not step brother, half brother. Yeah. Anyways, um, a cousin of my brother's grew up in a very like jungly part of Colombia. A uh, thick, thick, tr- uh, sort of uh, thick bushes with lots of greens and everything, but th- where the where the insects are huge, yeah, and the snakes are big and all these things. Uh, anyways, one time my brother was visiting and they were out in the bushes, right, and playing. And his cousin always carried a machete, and all of a sudden my brother sees a snake. Oh no, sorry, it was a spider. It was like um, they call him tripa de burro, and it's like these spiders with these like wiggly legs, but they're huge. They're 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 probably the size of a plate. They they're not poisonous, but they look terrifying, mm. right? My brother freaks out, and my co- and the cousin just apparently came came up, and without saying a word or missing a beat, single motion pulls machete out, slam down on the spider, and picks it up. And my brother's like, cool, <laughs> you know, and it was like, that was just like the reality. They just deal with this, you know, it's their daily, daily life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Imagine you're, you're, you live in the jungle and you're afraid of spiders. You oh, know, like, yeah, no. uh, like it's not going to work, <laughs> no. you know? All right. Well, that does it for that episode. Thanks for joining me out there, uh, us out there. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it.